most of the time when a dog is at its end of service, then the handler generally will take the dog and, and adopt him. And I was informed that if nobody took him that they would probably euthanize them. And for me, it was a no-brainer, and I said, I'll take him. That kind of opened the floodgates, and that's what really catapulted me into getting involved in this. For us, it's important that these dogs are never forgotten. And I think a lot of times they do get forgotten. And that's where an organization like the Warrior Dog Foundation steps in and, uh, and prevents that dog from being euthanized and, and we take them. Come on, buddy. These dogs ask nothing of us and provide so much for our troops, for our police officers, for our communities, for our nation. I spent a little over 12 years uh, active duty in the SEAL teams. I was on a deployment to Iraq when I was first just around military working dogs of any caliber. For me, that was really my light switch moment. Come on. We are the last ditch effort for a lot of these dogs. And the reality of it is every one of these dogs would be in, in a box full of ashes on somebody's desk if, if we weren't taking them. The capabilities and efficacy of these dogs is almost impossible to overstate. We've taken dogs from just about everywhere at this point. Uh, the U.S. military, Department of Defense, a state and local law enforcement, Customs Border Patrol, federal law enforcement. They're trained to apprehend and neutralize threats. On average, most dogs will spend the first several years of their life training to get to the level where they can either be deployed for the U.S. military or implemented on the street as a, as a police canine. Good pup. A number of the dogs, when they get here, have the human equivalent to PTSD. She's ready. She's always ready. It is kind of like running a kindergarten some days. Sit. Yes. But it's a lot of fun, too. Good girl. Good girl. The textbook principle that we employ here is using positive reinforcement to shape behavior. If loud helicopter noises or gunfire, things of that nature, are what's setting this dog off, then those need to be reintroduced, but very, very calculated. Even though they're retired, they're still in that working mindset. So we kind of would like to get them kind of de-stressed a little bit, decompressed, a little untrained, if you will, a little unwound, and just kind of let them know that like there's not a bomb around every corner, that it's okay for you to let your guard down and roll in the grass and chase butterflies again. One of the things I like to do with, uh, with the dogs is essentially just, just let them be a dog, you know, enjoy their time, stretch their legs, check things out, and then when they make that decision to come back to me, I, I mark it with this and, and give them a reward, and we just shape that behavior and build that trust. Eventually you'll notice that that dog isn't so high strung in the kennel anymore and then that's when you feel like it's probably okay for you to let him out and interact with him a little bit, just kind of see what he's about. We do chuck it, so it's just like a little orange ball and we just heave the crap out of it and all the way downfield the dogs tear after it, it's great, it's a lot of fun to watch. And then there are a couple dogs that you can play tug with, we just have to be a little more careful with that because I mean again the dogs are trained to take down threats if they have to. I've been bit more times than I can even count. If I get bit, it's my fault. That means that I have rushed the process too fast or I've put the dog in a position where I gave him the opportunity to make a mistake. Our main mission is to keep these dogs from being euthanized and then rehabilitate them to where they can live normal, happy lives. It's very much word of mouth, using our network to find suitable homes. We've had a number of people that have been great success stories. There's no greater update for me than getting a picture of, of a dog hanging out on a couch that used to be biting people here and, and being really difficult for us to deal with, so that, uh, that makes it all worth it. Rudy. Yeah. Our family has been Rudy's home the last year and a half. I was in the uh, veterinary corps in the United States Air Force for four years, and I, I grew up in a military family. We have a cattle business here. We raise grass-fed beef, and our cattle move every day. Rudy's with me all the time, all day long.
<laughs> That's his work environment and he's adjusted to it very well. He knows exactly what's going on every time we go to do something. Rudy's retired from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Law Enforcement Agency, and he uh, was used, obviously, anytime where he was needed, anywhere in the country, free to hunt and find whatever you're sending him after. That's how he lived. He's dedicated to what do you want me to do. He, he loves loving. If he, he knows he's working for you. Your typical family dog is picked out as a puppy and is raised with that family and just kind of lives life as a dog, loves life, goes outside, and life is great. Come here. And that's kind of what we want to emulate with the warrior dogs in their retired life. Climb. He's become part of our family. We're his to protect and to tell him what to do because that's what he wants to do. He wants to please you all the time. You have to have that passion and that desire for the dog because, I mean, they're gonna be a part of your family and they're gonna be probably the most loyal thing you've ever met in your life. You certainly can't go in there thinking it's just a dog. They're not. These are professional, highly trained, highly skilled, motivated, driven dogs. They're gonna keep doing it until they can't and uh, Mike's trying to give the best opportunity for that to happen. I'm glad our family has been able to be part of that. <laughs> <laughs>